Om Sadashiva Samarambam Shankara Sharya Madhyamam Asmada Sharya Pariyantam Bande Guru Param Param Ishwaro Guratmeti Muti Veda Vibhagine Pyo Mabda Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murta Yenamaha Sava Vedanta Sedanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sat Guru Pranatosh Maham Om Om Shachi 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 Om Namaste Welcome Tripura Uh, the previous verse, we we saw the Dattatreya father uh, uh, elaborating on this uh, on these teachings, huh? the teachings about the nature of Brahman consciousness and the states, and uh, the fact that uh, the world resolves into Brahman as a superimposition and uh, the mind is resolved in Brahman as a superimposition and uh, and we we could see some of these uh, these confusions often uh, yeah, relevant or, or often present in the in the mind of the seeker of moksha yeah? the reality and and reality. Uh, everything is of the nature of consciousness. There is nothing beyond consciousness, as we say. So, uh, Paramsarama said, Oh Lord, I find it difficult to follow your reasoning. And how can you say that abstract intelligence be, being only one manifest with? as a diversity of objects of creation. We have seen some of that. We have seen that the world is inert and the mind is sentient and consciousness is pure consciousness. And uh, how can the, the inert universe be resolved in consciousness if the universe is inert and Brahman is consciousness? So. Uh, just reminding ourselves of the teachings of Panchadas. So the inert universe resolves in consciousness uh, because the universe is Sat and consciousness Brahman is Sat. Uh, so we resolve the inert material universe in, in, in Brahman as Sat, as we know. And then he kept saying that experience does not prove the, uh, the, the and does not reveal the identity between consciousness and the world. So the world appears to be out there. Yes. So, and then we would have to go back to considering Samadhi. Why? Because in Samadhi, so the world disappears. And then we say, okay, only in Samadhi we can, we can say that uh, the Vedanta stands as uh, when Vedanta makes a statement that consciousness is the only reality, and then we have to go to Nivikalpa Samadhi because then we remove the world. But the key here is to understand that uh, the world is not really real. The world is Mitya, and I, consciousness, am Satyam. And, uh, and the world is just an appearance superimposition. So therefore, we don't, we do not need to go back to Samadhi, Nivikalpa Samadhi, to to reconcile these Vedantic statements. There is an identity between the world and Brahman and furthermore, Jiva Atma and Paramatma, which, which matters. We need to understand the identity of these two. Arlindo, you're breaking up quite a bit. Is that so? Yeah. Let me see what's going on here. Uh, 
Let me change it in here. So let me know. Uh, I, I, I can do another change in here if it does not get better, okay? But let me know. How can that be the self? Mind is always taken to be a faculty with which the self functions in the supramaterial plans. So the self has no attributes or, or faculties. Faculties are kind of uh, means or instruments or pramanas or, or talents or capacities uh, inherent to the self through Jivatima. Uh, which is uh, co reflected consciousness. So how can this, the mind be the self? The self is free of faculties and, and attributes and qualities and talents. And the mind is defined by attributes and qualities. So how can the two be the same? The self would be no better than insentient. And the mind is sentient as we have established and the mind gets its sentience from consciousness itself. Is it breaking up still? Just a little bit, not quite so often as before. And then there is something wrong with this provider. Let me change it. There is a, a strong wind today that could be affecting it. Okay, now we are connected with another internet provider. We'll see. It could get worse. Father, even the scriptures admit the liberation and bondage are only attitudes of the mind, according as it is unmodified and modified respectively. The mind modified, the mind once modified, it brings about uh, thoughts and objects. Huh? And then one feels like I'm, I'm bound to the world of objects. But we, we understand the game here. We understand the play of, of Maya. We understand that this appearance projection or superimposition does not bound anybody unless we are moved by our desires and aversions towards these superimpositions. You know, we have these objects appearing, these thoughts, and then if we are entangled, 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 entanglement, I forgot how to say that. If we are involved and hooked up with these things, you know, and then we're going to be, you know, we're going to feel like uh, 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 troubled because, uh, Ragas and versions are going to be disturbing the mind and the, uh, disturb the mind is very uncomfortable. And uh, we say that the mind is bound to its likes and dislikes. So this is the only source of suffering. We need to understand it. It's so simple, Vedanta. The source of, of suffering is, is to be identified and uh, attached to one's likes and dislikes, desires and aversions. Huh? Once we identified with these objects and thoughts as they appear, and then we say that the mind is modified. Now the mind is modified the moment that the object appears, but what's going to create bondage is my attachment and, and this energy of uh, attraction and repulsion towards these thoughts objects. So otherwise there is no question of bondage. That's, he's gonna say that the bondage is just an attitude of the mind, meaning to say, is mind moved by ignorance or knowledge? The attitude really is founded on knowledge or, or rather ignorance. If we are ignorance in respect to the nature of Mitya as a mere superimposition and the fact that these objects are not really real and they are not any source of, uh, of true happiness and freedom, so once we, we have that clear understanding and then the mental attitude and the mental pose of the mind is such that it's not suffering this attraction and repulsion towards the world. 
So this is the attitude here that liberates, which requires knowledge. There is no knowledge. There is no good attitude without knowledge. I mean, I remember Swami Dayananda make some good such songs around that, you know. So you cannot have a good attitude. You hear so much, oh, attitude is everything. Do have a good attitude here. So without knowledge, attitude, good attitude is not possible. You cannot just say, oh, yes, I'm going to have a positive attitude. You have to understand. Understand that we are free from all this appearance, you know, no matter how tragic it may, may appear to be. How can the mind be the self as well, its faculty? So how can the mind see the pure self at the same time an instrument of knowledge which is subject to modification and, and, and pleasure and pain all the time. Mind is modifying and according to vasanas and the, the, the interaction, you know, between one's vasanas and the object and the pita is going to modify and disturb the mind here and there if the mind is not stead and strong due to self-knowledge. So the mind is, is, is that, how can the mind be the self? You see, this, these are very fundamental doubts that are so simply to be resolved if we have a clear understanding of what's satya and what is mitya. So the nature of the mind is satya, huh? but it appears as a changing phenomenon in mitya. Huh? But even and we know that the mind has two aspects of itself. One is the physical material aspect, which is energy, subtle energy that produce the reflecting medium called the subtle body. That is the substantial material physical aspect of the mind. In several teachings of, uh, of James, he presents the subtle body as the mind. So I like to clarify and present the distinction from the very beginning. But uh, that is the material, physical, energetic, media nature of the mind. But the mind has another nature, which are thoughts. Yeah? And thoughts are self, are self aware or self-reflective. There is a, a self-reflection happening in the mind because I know and I know that I know. So this self-conscious mind that I know and I know that I know, I exist and I know that I exist, this is reflected consciousness. So we have to define the Jiva Atma. Is the Jiva Atma identified with thoughts, with the, the nature, the substantial nature of the subtle body, or it's identified with the witnessing principle which is often I present as the subtle intellect, the purified intellect, because it is the purified intellect that can have an objective view of thoughts, emotions, and even the substantial nature as matter energy, the subtle body. We have three bodies, yeah? So that has to be objectified and understood, yeah? So my subtle body is disturbed, maybe it's being, constitute by many thoughts which are uh, dominated by rajas and tamas. Therefore, uh, these rajas and tamas are disturbing this phenomena, which is the pure intellect, which is this reflected consciousness. It is, it is this reflect consciousness that has an identity in consciousness as consciousness, but it needs to be understood. Uh, how can the mind be the self and at the same time be an instrument to know the world? Again, granting that the world is an image on the mirror of consciousness. So how can this world appearing in this mirror be the self? The fact of its perfection is there. So the non-duality of consciousness does not follow. So the image appearing reflected in the in this in this mirror-like consciousness, huh? the mirror of consciousness. It's so clear and uh, it's so perfect that uh, it somehow and brings up 
questions in my mind in regards to the statement of uh, the non-dual nature of consciousness, meaning to say there is only consciousness, there is no world. There are no objects. Uh, did my internet get better? Mm, a little bit. <laughs> I think it, if it's, you're, you said you're having big wind. A little bit of wind. Uh, so yeah. if it gets any any worse, tell me that I go, because the other one is, is much superior. This one I have at least at the most five uh, megabytes speed. The other has been offering uh, 40 to 60. So, oh. but there must be something happening which I was not aware until we began the class. Shall yeah, I... both are problematic at the moment, yeah. Let me give it a try to see if they solve that little problem. It, it, it usually does not happen. So I went back to my, my better provider, my better signal, which is a cable. The world is an image in the, on the mirror of consciousness. The fact of its perfection is there. It's precise, it's tangible. So how can the nature of reality be non-duality? The nature of consciousness, how can it be one without the world? It does not follow. There are hallucinations known like a rope mistaking for a serpent. Hallucination is not correct knowledge, but it does not end the duality attendant on its perfect perception. So this is a good one. So now he brings the concept of uh, duality and knowledge, uh, but uh, uh, it is very evidently a, a bad knowledge because it is a, a, a human superimposition. We, we have projected, uh, a, ro uh, a cobra, a serpent, as he says that. A serpent on the rope. Yeah? So we do that. If our mind is a little bit more rajasic or tamasic, we, may, we make mistakes, we project. We know this thing from the early days of working our way yeah? into spirituality. Oh, watch out, you are projecting. Yeah? Oh, you are projecting. So we all project. Yeah? So we know that one. So, and some projections are, are very much off, like seeing, seeing the, the serpent on the rope. So, hallucination is not correct knowledge, but it does not end the duality attendant on its perception. So, even if you, you are projecting, it's still there is duality, and this, uh, this bad knowledge is still represents duality. So image, image cannot serve any useful purpose, whereas the universe is enduring and full of purpose. So I'm trying to see why uh, uh, Parajurama brought this, this argument here. So we know that there are projection. Yeah? To see the snake on the rope is a, is a huge projection, but it's, it's not really something uncommon. How much knowledge we have is incorrect knowledge. And that I could accept because we are talking about myself uh, 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 perceiving something uh, wrongly. Yeah? And even if I perceive something wrong, which is an imagination, duality is still there. It perceives, I perceive through duality. So the big challenge here is like on, when I project, it's easy to say that the, uh, the snake is not real, but uh, the world, the world is a projection of my shuara. So how can I say that the world is not real? You understand? So I can establish that some, some of my perceptions are wrong knowledge. But uh, because it's my projection, yeah? it is my own interpretation. Yeah? But I'm sure that uh, my interpretation in regards to the physical material world is common knowledge. Everybody experiences a tree as a tree, a cat as a cat, a house as a house. It's physical, it's material, it's tangible. 
and there is a common sense about that. No, 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 these things, we cannot challenge that. This planet is round. This house is, you know, so and so and so on. So hallucination is not correct knowledge, but it does not end the duality. It's still, again, unreal image cannot serve any useful purpose, whereas the universe is enduring and full of purpose. So to, to hold uh, any, I don't know if he's trying to say that uh, to, to, to superimpose uh, hallucination on real images not, does not serve any purpose. It's still, there is duality, but it does not do anything. Whereas the universe is enduring and full of purpose. Okay, he says that this universe is something very much of the nature of reality. Because when we have an hallucination, we can get back to our sense and say, no, I was tripping. And then the snake disappears. But the universe is enduring. And, uh, and, and my projection, my hallucination did not endure. And moreover, it's not purposeful, you know, even though uh, the dream projection has certain purpose with seeing the realm of the dreamer itself. Right? The dreamer can have a good time enjoy some punya dream yeah? and uh, but it's not to the point of this unfoldment here so the universe is it seems to endure and be permanent and it it's full of purpose as we can tell tell me how you assert this universe to be unreal thus establishing the non-duality of the supreme self reality uh, how can you assert that? Furthermore, if the world itself is unreal, how does that unreality happen to distinguish between fact and hallucination in the affairs of Jivatma in life? So uh, he brings another argument. Uh, this one is, seems to be a good one. If the world is real, is unreal, how does that unreality, you know, which the world happens or, or manage to distinguish between fact and hallucination in Jivatma's affairs of life? Okay, so there is no contradiction in that regards. The world is unreal, you know, but there is something real pervading the world. Yeah. You know? The world, as far as Namarupas, oh, you know, <clears throat> names and shapes and colors, is unreal. Huh? But it is superimposed on something which is real. Duality is not really there, and the world cannot exist without Satya. So you will need to have Satya. To, to provide apparent reality to this superimposition. The world itself is unreal. And we see that, that unreal apparent reality happens to have spikes of consciousness in the human consciousness that knows the apparent objects and sometimes knows and recognizes that my knowledge is good, my knowledge is not good. That happens within the realm of reflective consciousness, human consciousness, and due to the grace of original limitless consciousness. You follow? Is the internet any better? Yeah, it seems to be still breaking up, but less often. Did you guys follow this last passage? Jivatma exists within Mitya. Mitya is unreal. And the Parasurama is saying, so if 
if the world is unreal, if the jiva, né, the human beings are unreal, how can, how can there be knowledge to distinguish hallucination and, uh, and, and projections? And, and real knowledge, bad knowledge and real knowledge. So if the world is just unreal, how come there is certain consciousness, some knowingness, able, capable, capable to know good knowledge from bad knowledge? And the ultimate bad knowledge is that the world is real. And the ultimate good knowledge it is the Upanishad knowledge revealed by the Lord that the world is unreal, not real, it's unreal. And the world is just a superimposition on that reality, which is Brahman. So how that knowledge takes place? That knowledge takes place in the mind of the Jiva Atma because Jiva Atmas are, yeah, are Consciousness, they have this shining consciousness all the time. The fact the entire world it shines because it has consciousness pervading it. You know? The concept of the shiny world, you know, of, of Jen. So everything is there sitting or, or soaking on consciousness. And it's this consciousness that allows human beings to distinguish between fact and hallucination as far as Mitya, uh, Mitya uh, experience is concerned. So we have this spike of consciousness all the time in every living creatures, even the chicken. And uh, so, and that's what we have in common with, uh, with Brahman, okay, our nature in uh, such it and this nature is limitless yeah it's still more how does everybody happen to have the same hallucination of mistaking the real phenomena for reality so this reminded me and Sylvia Sylvia is going to remember that Sylvia is here so we were there uh, in Lucknow with Papaji on those early days. And my son was very small. Uh, he was somewhere uh, seven, eight years old. And uh, one day he raised his hand in satsang. And then he says, I have a question, Papaji. And then he says, you say that uh, this world is a dream. Yeah? If this world is a dream, how come everybody dreams it exactly the same? Well, which is being said here. I was very, very happy to see this question, this inquiry uh, happening here because it was my son at the time. Papa G did not answer. He could have elaborated for the sake of us and to my son, but somehow Papa G for whatsoever reason, he did not say much. He just uh, laughed and so on. He said, good boy, good boy, good boy. So how come the world is unreal? It's like a dream. How come it's a hallucination? How come everybody is having the same hallucination? Huh? Good question, huh? So who can answer this question? Well, there are levels of unreality. There's Paktibasika reality, which is uh, in our own minds. And then there's the Viveka, the phenomenal reality, the empirical reality. So there's levels, yeah. Um, but ultimately, they both resolve into consciousness. Yeah. Anything from you, Lynn? Well, you know, how do you know that everybody has the same reality? I mean, basically, the reality only belongs to the self, and that's you. So, I mean, yeah. how how do you know that? Well, the question here, like my son at the time, 
so the world is is just a, a dream a projection how uh, how does everybody happen to have the same hallucination okay so we go to the two orders of reality one is the the vyavaharika and vyavaharika is a projection caused by maya ishwara so this projection of maya ishwara is there it appears to be enduring and real. Huh? Only on further examination, we can understand with the help of the scriptures of Vedanta that it's not really enduring and much less real, okay? But everybody has the same uh, perception of reality in this physical, material, tangible world. So everybody fell for this hallucination because Maya is the big guy, <laughs> the greatest illusionist. So everybody takes uh, Vyavaharika to be a fact, physical, material, universe. Yeah? And then the way we relate to this physical, material, universe is subject to, to different opinions according to our vasanas, okay? So everybody's going to have a different uh, Pratibhasika experience. But the Vyavaharika, everybody is fell for the hallucination, such as this physical material world exists and it is real. Because Maya is, is a great tricker, trickers, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was the question of my son that Papa G did not answer. And I suspect he did not have the means to answer that could be answered in few words like I did now or an hour satsang around this. All these doubts are troubling me. Please clear them for me. Let's say what Dattatreya, the greatest guru, is going to say if he's going to address this question 54. Dattatreya, the omniscient, heard this question <clears throat> and he was very pleased with them. And he proceeded to answer them. You have done well, good questions, Parasurama, to ask these questions, although not for the first time. And then he just pulled a little bit, you know, uh, uh, how you say? He just poked a little bit. I mean, come on, it's a good question, but I you know it's already, you you have to get over these doubts. So because we, we have addressed them before, you no? Know? They must be examined until one is truly convinced. So therefore, bring it up. Bring it on, even if it's a thousand times, because we need to clear any and all questions and doubts. How can the guru himself anticipate all the doubts of the disciple unless the disciple states them clearly? And you did state them clearly. Huh? There are different grades of mind and different temperaments too on every disciple. He's trying to say, so Vedanta uh, does the best to anticipate all questions and doubts. That's why our scriptures, they appear as dialogues between the guru and the disciple. But mm -hmm. uh, yet, you know, the, the disciple needs to, to expose its doubts, yeah? one's doubts, again and again, every time he has the privilege of relating to a teacher, because all doubts of the disciple uh, are not going to be known by the teacher. It needs to be clearly stated. I mean, the teacher usually knows what are the most predominant and common doubts with time and experience. But there are different minds, different grades, different levels of understanding, of assimilation. And there are also different temperaments too. How can clear knowledge be gained and established, be established if one's doubts are not raised to be resolved? The student with analytical turn of mind gains deep-seated knowledge. No, that's good. No, it reminds me of Swami <clears throat> Shivayananda when he used to say, Analyze! You remember that? Analyze. Analyze!
<laughs> His question helped towards depths of knowledge. The unquestioning student is of no use. The earnest student is recognized by his questions, his, her questions. We, I mean, I, I try to tell people here in Brazil that uh, don't raise questions prematurely because in the beginning, there are a lot of people that start throwing questions before they they went through, they got through the, the Shravana uh, stage, you know? They just bring, you know, uh, the first uh, 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 difference between his spiritual understanding and what Vedanta is present. And then we tend to say, just take it easy, go through the Shravana first, and then later on, uh, you see what questions you still have because the, the very teaching is going to solve most of those questions. Amen. Uh, but once we, we did a good chunk of, uh, of Shravanam and uh, we recognize those persistent questions and doubts and suspiciousness, and then we need to bring them to the surface. Consciousness is one, but as we know, there are there are uh, students and disciples that are shy. That they, they have a different tem temperament as well, you know. And they kind of, okay, now I'm going to benefit from others' questions, but somehow I'm shy. I'm afraid to to expose myself, you know. My self esteem is not so strong, so we have to take all of that in consideration as well. Consciousness is one and non dual but it shines as if diversified like the clean surface of a mirror reflecting varied, varied colors. Note how the mind is unmodified in sleep remains single and, bl and blank, and it's later modified by dream and manifests as the dream world. Similarly, the one consciousness, Sri Tripura, shines forces the various phenomena of the apparent physical material universe, or even the subtle universe as well, because uh, we have the subtle world that's at our disposal also uh, in the waking state because, uh, you know, we we think, we dream, we project, we hallucinate, you know. So this is a very good analogy. We know that the mind in deep sleep is unmodified, is at rest, and there is nothing there. So if there is nothing in, in consciousness, in that deep sleep state, how come that same mind yeah, is going to modify to project the dream universe? Yeah? So it's a, it's an excellent parallel to to explain yeah, that the human mind is there, unmodified, in peace, yeah? and then there is nothing. There is no knower, not, not known objects or experience or events. And then a dream, uh, something shakes in, shakes up, we see the, the Vasana load. And then there is a modification, uh, dream-like <laughs> dream modifications and the dream world appears. So this is a miracle how my mind has this power to project out of itself. Huh? Isn't it? Mm. The mind yeah. is neither shakti, boom, projects it. So if the mind can project its own universe, which is, you know, the very contents of that individual mind uh, being projected somehow, you know, as we know. So why to wonder, I mean, that consciousness uh, can project this physical material universe. If you yourself can project your, your dream universe, you know? Similarly, this one non-dual conscious existence, 
né? referred here as Sri Tripura, flash forth this various phenomenon called the universe of objects. The cognizer and the cognized object are seen in dream also. So when we are dreaming there as well, we have a cognizer, the knower, and the known objects. So we see that uh, even a blind man without sight perceives objects in a dream. I don't know. I, I'm not blind, <laughs> but I believe that uh, if a blind man perceives objects during the dream, no, they, of course he's going to perceive them yeah. because the fact that they don't have eyes to see, they have the other four sense organs to collect data as well, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then in the dream, uh, objects are going to project. And there are people say, "How does that look like?" Oh, it looks like the. Oh, and you put your hands, and uh, we don't know how they experience Namarupa, yeah. the blind people. Yeah? But uh, oh. it's he, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know my mic was off. On um, is curious. How would they? perceive color. Yeah. How how can they perceive colors? I don't um, know. Uh, uh, shapes, uh, uh, we could say that uh, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it, the, the, it doesn't matter. The scripture is saying that even blind men uh, perceives objects in the dream state. So let's take it to be a fact, you know? So it's a kind of object that was defined according to to their collections of data, but they don't have the eyes collecting shape and colors. Huh? But they could still perceive certain objects. How does he do so unless by mental perception? So the mental perception, where these mental perceptions are coming from? Are coming from the contact with the world through the other four channels of perception. And maybe we bring some vasanas from previous birth that allows us even dream color, you know? Who knows? Can anything be known at the time or place in the absence of the light of the mind? So he's, he's praising the mind. See, the mind has tremendous power. Huh? It, it knows the universe and projects the dream world. And it is there to perceive the physical material world, which was created by another power, Maya power, Maya Shakti. How can anything be known at any time or place in the absence of the light of the mind? Huh? There can be no image in the absence of a mirror, for the images are not apart from the mirror. So now he's present the mind again as the reflecting medium, mm, you know, on which uh, the objects are reflect. Okay, the thoughts and the objects are reflect. Thoughts are objects as well that appears within the mind. The mind is uh, being described here as the reflecting medium in this case. There can be no image, meaning to say, thoughts and an object in the absence of the mind. The mind is a mirror for the images are not apart from the mirror. Now that's where uh, the mind itself, the thoughts and the determinations in regards to the object and your thoughts that Jiva Atchima you know, experience can be resolved in the reflecting medium because how can there be image in the absence of a mirror for the images are not apart from the mirror. So this is the mind being present as the reflecting medium as well, the mirror-like subtle body. Similarly, nothing is cognizable if it lies beyond the pale of the cognizing principle. So we cannot recognize anything without the reflecting medium, the mind as a reflecting medium. So the world are imagings occurring in the mind. Okay, 
So the, the, the object are experienced by anybody. So the way we'll, we'll assert those objects, interpret them is individual né, to each one of us. But uh, the mind, it's going to provide the mirror-like uh, <coughs> subtle body on which the image and thoughts uh, happens to appear and not apart from the mind itself. Similarly, nothing is cognized if it lies beyond the pale of the cognizing principle. So nothing can be cognized if it lies beyond the pale of conscious, the re-consciousness, the cognizing principle. For the same reason, I say that the mind cannot lie apart from consciousness in the abstract. So the mind is an object. The object appears and they are cognized because they are reflecting the mind. But the mind is integral part of media. For the same reason, I say that the mind, the reflecting media, cannot lie or exist apart from the macro, ma macro uh, mirror-like reflecting media, which is Maya. Uh, Maya Shakti or the Supreme Consciousness, because many times the teachings, they resolve Maya in, Ishu, in Brahman, you know. The mind contains such and cheat aspects of Brahman, good insight into the fact that I am, is the closest to consciousness. Okay, this is a note I wrote. Similarly, nothing is cognizable if, if it lies beyond the pale of the cognizing principle. So we cannot cognize anything uh, if, we, if it's not blessed by consciousness, uh, the cognizing principle. I say that the mind cannot lie apart uh, from intelligence, from consciousness in the abstract. So the mind contains certain cheat aspects of Brahman. I had this insight, sometimes I write a note. The mind, as we know, the mind is resolved in Brahman as Brahman because it, it is by nature, it does exist and it, it does have consciousness. Every mind is a reflector of consciousness. The mind contains such and cheat aspects of Brahman. Good insight into the fact that I am is the closest to consciousness. So consciousness is the cheat aspect of Brahman. The moment that we realize I, I know and I know that I know, I am and I know that I am, is the closest uh, <laughs> The, is the closest nature uh, uh, of Jiva Atma to consciousness. I am is the closest to consciousness. So I don't remember exactly why I, I wrote this note. No, it's not popping in my mind. Good insight into the fact that I am. The mind, has, I think I was trying to remember or to bring about back the concept that the mind has its substantial physical aspect, which is the reflecting medium, okay? And that is Sat. The mind contains Sat and Chit aspects of Brahman. Now I remember. So it came to my mind that the mind is being discussed from, from two angles uh, here and there. So it's substantial material aspect as the reflecting mirror-like apparatus, no? And then, uh, and then uh, it contains Sat and Chit. So, such is the, the physical reflecting medium. Eh? And uh, although it's a physical subtle matter, eh? and cheat is the, the, the self-reflective uh, I am and, and the world is, the, the, the thoughts that require uh, the, the sentient aspect of the mind as the cognizer of the thoughts and the world. No, eh? it has to be cognized by a sentient aspect of the mind. So the mind contains two aspects, the such existence as far as its, uh, its substantial nature and cheat. Yeah? So aspects of Brahman. Good insight into the fact that I am is the closest to consciousness. 
So I am, and the insight into the fact that I exist is the closest to consciousness. So I exist, I don't remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember uh, why I wrote that note right now, but it is. it was profound, it's one of those moments, but I'm not uh, recollecting exactly uh, what was the insight over there. Just says that, let's see if it pops up pops in the next follow, uh, following ever. Just as the cognizer, the cognition and the cognize are identified with the mind in a dream, so also the seer, the sight and the phenomena are identical with the mind in the awakeful state. So this is beautiful. <clears throat> when we have the, the dream, we have the, the dreamer, the guy who is chasing something in the dream world. And uh, he has cognized something that he likes, for example. Huh? And then we have the cognizer and then the object and the experience experience itself, the cognition and the cognize, the experiencer, the experience and the experience, the knower, the known object and the knowledge gained in that relationship between the knower and the known. So just as these three principles uh, of duality, you know, the, the, the knower, the known and the knowledge, uh, identical, with the mind in the dream. So when we dream, there are all the three are there. No? But uh, we can uh, easily realize that they are one and the same, okay? It is just the mind projecting the dream world. So in which there is the, the dreamer, the dreamed, yeah? and, the, and the dream ex ex experience itself. So the same way the seer, the sight, and the phenomenon, no? So we have the seer, the scene, and the, the act of, uh, of, uh, of seeing, of sight. No? Seeing, sight, and seeing. Seer, sight, and seeing. So also the seer, sight, and seeing are identical with the mind in the awakeful state. So another parallel there say, so in the awake state, you have to understand that the mind also is there appearing as the as the experiencer in the awake awakeful state, and uh, have an experience of an object which was experienced? Okay, so we have this trinity. Okay, we see the awakeful state as well. So, and we have to understand that these apparent these uh, divisions, uh, the the experiencer, the experience, and the experience, they are just the mind. Yeah, they, they happen within the mind in the awakeful state. Yeah? They are identified as the mind. This is all mind. Mind appears how? Appears as the knower, the known, and the knowledge gained. So all of that, uh, 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 a part of the mind, you know, it's one phenomenon, let's say. Just as a gnat was created in the dream for feeling, feeling, feeling a tree, which is the purpose for each? It was designed so the, is the mind said to be the faculty for giving perception. So the mind is an instrument, as we have established several times, is an instrument for knowledge experience. We have an axe, an axe to cut or to 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 groom some trees. No? Uh, just as an axe was creating the dream for, for you know, pruning a tree, for example, which is the purpose, it was in the dream, okay? But it was there. It was designed to do that. So is the mindset to be the faculty for giving perception. So the mind is giving the perception and the mind has its faculty of, of knowing, experiencing, 
the same way the wax was there uh, fulfilling its purpose, you know, its faculty of, uh, of, of cutting and pruning trees or cutting trees. It was designed for that. The mind was likewise designed to produce perception and uh, experience and knowledge. But Rama, the faculty can be only of the same degree of reality as the action itself. So we have the faculty of the acts in the dream state, and then it served the purpose to, to, to prune the tree, but the tree in the dream state. Yeah? So the faculty can only be of the same degree of reality as the action itself for was anyone injured at any time by a human horn? So we are talking, uh, the action and the instrument must clearly be of the same degree of truth. So we're talking about different orders of reality. And uh, the mind, the mind is said to be the faculty for giving perception and knowledge. But this mind, is going to give perception and knowledge to different orders of reality. And we could expand that to the mind who, who does perceive and experience uh, different uh, locus or, or orders of reality. Like I have a friend of mine who, who has those experiences and studied much of these esoteric things, you know? And, uh, and let's say that the mind is going to have faculties and uh, to access the different, uh, different fields of knowledge, perception, knowledge, it requiring specific bodies as well. Yeah? Every one of these different locus requires a different body, the same way the dream state, we need to go there with the, the dream body, yeah? which is a different body. Subtle body. So uh, the mind is said to be the faculty to give experience, perception, and knowledge. But the faculty can be only of the same degree of reality as of the action itself. For was anyone injured at the time by a human horde? No, nobody. So, but in a in a dream, maybe, yeah. If in a, in a moment of hallucination, we may see somebody being, being hurt by that. We see that hallucination, the action and the instrument, but must clearly be of the same order of reality or degree of truth. So I think he's trying to make a distinction of these different orders of reality, as we say, and knowing that whatever, uh, actions take place in one of these realms, you know, can only uh, affect, uh, affect that order of reality, but uh, we cannot be <clears throat> injured by anything that happens in the dream state and we will never go to jail for a crime we have committed in the dream state. So the action stands within the, that realm now. Yeah? So the action of the mind and the instrument must clear be the same. Since the action itself is unreal, can the mind, the faculty be real? <clears throat> so we, he's present the mind as an instrument that does act somehow because the analogy here with the acts uh, it, it does serve a purpose, you know, of certain actions. And the mind is said to be the faculty of giving perception. So the mind does give perception, uh, but uh, there is not much doing in regards to that. There is no much action involved to that. No? So the intellect could have some intellectual uh, uh, exercise to try to, to, to understand and uh, 
the, those apprehensions, those perceptions. Huh? So, but here he puts the mind is said to be the faculty for giving perception. But he keeps bringing the thing that the, the actor, the action itself has to be uh, the same degree of reality with the instrument. So I'm having a little trouble to see the mind as an instrument that acts in order to produce perception. So can you guys help me with some insights? Lindo, I've been wondering if he's talking, you know, Swami Paramartananda talks about the super waker. So is, is he trying to show us the asanga nature that the mind itself is part of mitya and then so it's like lucid dreaming is that anything you think that's where he's going i don't know we better read a little bit more anything from you mark you seem i believe you read the, the text before i think um He's talking about thinking as an action here and daydreaming as an action. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And imagining as okay. an action. Yeah, it's a mental action, we could say in that sense. Yeah. It goes in automatic, but it's still it's an action. Yeah. I think it's more on those lines. The action and the instrument, the instrument is the mind, and the action must clearly be of the same degree or same order of reality. Since the action itself is unreal, since the action itself is unreal, can the mind, the faculty be real? So the mind is uh, the faculty which allows us to know things. And the action, he's saying that is the action of thinking about the phenomenal world to try to access well, reality or, or, or some good knowledge. Everything is happening within the realm of media or reality or appearing to reality. Since the action of the mind trying to figure out what's going on is unreal. The mind itself is an instrument which allows us to, to go through the, the mental action of uh, processing experience to, to know. Yeah? Uh, it's equally unreal. The action is real. So the mind, which is an instrument, must be unreal. So, Rama, there is no faculty known as the mind. So, there is no instrument known as the mind. Mind is only surmised, surmised for the location of the dream subject, dream vision, and dream object. Its reality is of the same order as that of a dream. So now he brought the mind to the dream state, established that the mind uh, is just uh, surmised for the location of the dream. It's only there. It's the instrument to know that, that projection. And it's going to capture the, the objects, the vision, and, and even the, the experience of the dreamer itself is captured many times in a by the mind in the dream state. Its reality is of the same order as of the dream. Yeah, so we have a dream. And then we see in the dream, we have the instrument by which yeah, uh, uh, thoughts appear and objects appear. So dream, dream vision and dream objects and the dream dreamer. So we have this triad again, dream dreamer, dream vision, and dream object. Its reality is of the same order as that of a dream.
oh, it's already passed to, to Alf. So these are, are very philosophical, very subtle, and uh, I'm going to read it again to see if some uh, some better insights come up. And uh, I invite you guys to do the same. And we meet again next Monday, okay? And then we go through this, uh, this more difficult part of the Tripura. Okay, okie dokie. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachate Purna Sia Purnamadaya Purname Babashishate Om Shanti 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 Thank you, thank you Lord, thank you my dear friends. Uh, we meet again this coming Monday. Namaste. Okay, thank you, Alinda. God bless. God bless.